Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Let us gather ourselves together. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We honor you. We bless your name. We thank you for allowing us to be here once again. We thank you for giving us another opportunity to come before you, to ask you for forgiveness, and to receive forgiveness from you, and for teaching us how to forgive others, even when they don't ask for it. We thank you, God, for allowing us to be in this building, to gather together once again. We thank you for loving us so much that you don't want us to be ignorant, and you don't want us to be ignorant of the devices of our enemy or to be ignorant of our enemies. So we thank you, Father, for every opportunity that you provide for us to hear your word, to receive your teachings, to use them in our everyday lives and to be able to teach them to others. We thank you for giving us power and authority in Christ Jesus to bind and to loose. You have given us power and authority over all the power of our enemy and nothing by any means shall harm us. In the name of Jesus, we bind everything every spirit that will try to hinder this lesson on tonight, that will try to distract, that will try to get us to get off subject, off topic, that will try to block people from hearing what your spirit has to say to your people on tonight. We bind up sickness and diseases and we lose the power of your spirit in every area of our lives. We lose victory in you, oh God. We lose healing, we lose deliverance. We bind up fear, we lose courage and boldness in you, God. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. For those of you, I think everybody in here know me. Minister Trish, Reverend Trish, Trish. Amen. We'll be teach I'll be teaching on the spirit of infirmity. And I like the way the author even describes it. It's the spirit. Amen. We'll be we're on chapter nine. And I only need a few volunteers because as I look at these scriptures, a lot of the scriptures repeat itself. So I probably only need, I need someone to read Luke chapter 13, verse 11. You have it? And someone to read John chapter 5, verse 5. Who said that? Okay. Someone to get Acts chapter 3, verse 2. Someone to read Acts 10, verse 38. Okay. Yep. And Matthew 7, verse 20. Good evening, prophet. Good to see you in the house. Matthew 7, verse 20. You read it? Okay. 
in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Did you say yes, um, Sister Dahlia? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Amen. I give honor to God, for he is truly a good, good God. Hallelujah. I give honor to all the leadership and everybody in their perspective places. Thank you all for being here. I give God, God honor for Apostle Susan Howard for blessing us to have a home where we are safe, where we learn, and we can teach. Amen? Amen. So, Minister Jerry, Luke 13 and 11, please. Eighteen years. When I read that, I thought about a person being born into the age of eighteen. She was had this infirmity for a whole child to adult life. The age of a, the years that would make a person legally an adult. John chapter five verse five. Thirty-eight years. Acts chapter three, verse two. Acts chapter three, verse two. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried there. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the Beautiful Gate, so he could beg for beg from the people going into the temple. From birth, and it, the scripture describes him as a man. So that's a long time, amen. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Evangelist Gwen. Who was he oppressed by? Sister Dahlia, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, <clears throat> variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness. Those are the works of the flesh. Also, door openers to unclean spirits to come in. Amen. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Sister Gwen. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Amen. So you will know them by their fruits. Good fruit, bad fruit. But you'll know them by their fruits. Again, last time I was up here, I had a long chapter, and this one I think is even longer. I'm going to ask that the questions and the testimonies, and the, if you hear something that trigger a thought and you want to share, I'm, I, you may not be able to do so because I really want to get us through this lesson. Amen. If you have a question, you can write it down. You can submit it if you don't get a chance to ask it here. But it's very important for us to get through this lesson and get to the prayer at the end. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Okay, page 93, chapter 9, the spirit of infirmity. And here's what the author is saying. We have ministered the word as missionary evangelists in the areas of faith, healing, 
and deliverance for many years in Latin America and the United States. We are convinced both by the word of God and by experience that it is God's will to save, heal, and deliver anyone who will accept Christ as the Lord and Savior of his life, believe the word, live according to the word, and act on the word of God with the special faith that comes by hearing God's word. Now here in my notes, I wrote, infirmity, infirmity is a spirit, and it's a spirit with a name. But we know that every name must bow to the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we don't have to fear infirmity or any other spirit. Amen? Amen. Now here, the authors were stating how they had ministered in both Latin America and in the United States. And he even gave a prescription, if you will, on how to be healed to be saved, healed, and delivered. And one, he said, you accept Christ as Lord and Savior. You have to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're leading someone in prayer on deliverance, you want to take care of that first. Then the second thing, you have to believe on his word. There are many people who sit in the church and hear the word, but it's not activated in their lives because they don't believe it. You have to live according to the word. So not just be a hearer of the word, as the book of James says, but you also have to be a doer of the word. And you have to act on the word with special faith that comes by hearing, not having have heard. I heard it all my life. I grew up in church. I heard it already. No, you have to keep hearing the word of God. It has to be a continuous thing. Then you will experience salvation, healing, and deliverance. Amen? I remember an elderly lady in Managua, Nicaragua, I hope I said that right, who came to our open air crusade. She had been bent double at the waist for 20 years. After accepting the Lord and believing his word, she was instantly healed and walked back home as straight as everyone else. So it was after she heard the word and after she believed the word that she received her healing. Amen? Amen. And that is a similar healing in the, test, in the New Testament, which tells us about the spirit of infirmity, which Minister Jerry had read, which reads, And behold, there was a woman, a woman which had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years, and she was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called to her and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thy infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So when God heals us, we have to give him the glory. We can't just take the healing and just, you know, go on. We need to give God the glory. Amen? But Jesus spoke to her and declared to her that she would be healed, that she was loose. That meant she was bound. In order for her to be loose, in order for Jesus to have loosed her, she had to have been bound. And the scripture said that she was bound by the spirit, the spirit of infirmity. In verse 16, Jesus spoke even more clearly concerning the cause of the woman's condition. And here he says, and ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond. So Satan bound her. Satan put the infirmity on her. We can never say we sick because God made us sick. God don't make us sick. Amen? Luke was careful to note that the spirit of infirmity uses sickness to bind people thus making infirmities basically works of Satan. So who bound her? Satan did. And who was she? A daughter of Abraham. Now the question I pose to you is, whose child are you? 
Are you a child of the Most High King, the Most High God? Where does sickness and disease and infirmity come from? It comes from Satan, not God. But who heals? God. Amen? Amen. It is God's will to heal all who are oppressed by the devil. So if you have a sickness or disease or infirmity, do not question whether or not God wants you healed. The question is, do you believe God wants you healed? Do you believe God's word? Do you believe that God can heal you today? And having spoiled you principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Infirmity started in Eden. Where? In Eden. In the Garden of Eden, God instructed Adam, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And that reminded me of Proverbs 18 and 21 that talks about death and life is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So we have to be careful of what we eat of it. Amen? When Eve, and be careful what you speak. Because if you speak in sickness over your body, you're speaking illness and you're speaking all of that, you're going to eat that fruit. And just like the fruit that they were not supposed to partake of, don't partake of ungodly fruit of any kind. Don't allow the enemy to use you to curse your own self because the only power that he has is what you give him. Amen? And then he'll turn around and blame you for the sickness. When Eve broke the commandment of God and acted as Satan's accomplice in tempting Adam, the results of their sin was death for the entire human race. Adam and Eve died in an instant, spiritually, as sin slashed the cords of fellowship between God and mankind. So they did experience a death, but it wasn't a physical death. It was a spiritual death, a separation from God. But thank God for Jesus who bridged the gap. Amen? Amen. Physical death was more gradual as death fastened its tentacles on their bodies for the first time after a period of centuries the perfect body that God had fashioned finally succumbed to disease and Adam died. The ground rules are still the same today. When we obey God's commandments, there is healing for us. So if you want healing, you have to obey God's commandments. Amen? If we follow the devil lies of unbelief, and fear, our health will be negatively affected. So you have to make up in your mind who you're going to believe. And just make up in your mind, I'm not going to be afraid to trust God and believe God for a healing. Amen? Jesus was made in the likeness of men, Philippians 2 and 7. Took our infirmities and bare our sickness, Matthew 18 and 17. And with his stripes, we are healed, Isaiah 53 and 5. This is why we're healed. This is why healing belongs to you as a child of the Most High King, because Jesus took care of it. He bore our sicknesses. He took our infirmities, and by his stripes, we are healed. Luke mentioned that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. You see, it is God's will to heal all who are oppressed by the devil. Jesus would certainly not do anything against the will of God. Again, it is the will of God for all to be healed. So don't single yourself out and well say that's for them, that's not for me. 
I don't, I've done so much. God don't love me. I'm not there yet. I don't pray an hour yet. Just as Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, so he also paid the price for our healing by receiving the stripes upon his back. He didn't do that for nothing. It meant something. Every strike on his back, it meant something. It was paying the price for your healing. Amen? It is as unreasonable to believe that God does not want to save everyone from their sins as it is to say he does not want to heal them from their diseases. Why wouldn't God want you healed? Why would you allow the enemy, the devil, to convince you that that healing some, time, some kind of way give God glory or God is punishing you with a, a sickness? Trust me. I believe I've been walking with the Lord long enough to know if he did anything to you, he bold enough to tell you he did it. So unless he knocked on your door or visit you in the night and say, hey, I gave you cancer. Okay. The atonement that Jesus provided was a complete work for our body, souls, and spirit. Jesus didn't just come and suffer for us to be saved. That included our healing, too. Complete healing. Everything. Mind, body, soul. Everything about you. Amen? Be consistent. How strange it is that a Christian who believes God only heals certain people doesn't hesitate to go to the hospital when he is sick. You would think he would stay sick and not go against what he feels is God's will for him. If you don't believe that God wants you healed, God, almighty God, the true and living God, the creator of everything, the king of kings, Lord of the one is above all things. If you don't believe he wants you healed, then why would you go to a doctor? Why even look for a healing if you don't believe God wants you healed? It is God's will for you to be healed, whatever it is, whatever sickness it is, sickness of the mind, body, spirit, whatever it is. It is God's will for you to be healed. And anything that you hear up outside of that is not of God. To overcome that problem, the belief has been taught that God uses sickness to teach his children the lessons they should learn or to discipline them. Now, why would God need to use sickness or disease to teach you a lesson? God is smarter than that. He don't need to use sickness or disease to teach anybody a lesson. God knows how to talk, and he speaks all of our languages. Amen? This is why we need to be in Bible study, so we can learn the truth. So when we hear false doctrines like that, well, God put that sickness on you because you know you ran the streets all your life. No. God put that sickness on you so you could come to him and pray to him and acknowledge him. No. He know where you live. He know how to get your attention. He don't have to use an infirmity, a spirit of infirmity to get your attention. I always ask those people, if they discipline or teach their children by injuring them in some brutal manner, if you...
he said in his word, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So when you hear people say, God hear all prayers. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now you try and pray to God with iniquity in your heart and see if he don't flash a movie before your face or what you need to get together before he even hear you. Amen. So that's a note for those who pray. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Now we're talking about when we do communion. Amen. Who, wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that either and drink it unworthily eateth and drink in damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, died prematurely. That's why it's so important to not play when we're doing communion, when we're taking communion. First of all, it's not a joke. Second of all, you need to take time to examine yourself. I don't care if somebody told you what you're doing. You good, girl. No, you better check with God and make sure that you don't have any iniquity in your heart. So when you take up that communion, you receive the healing. Because if you take it unworthily, then you cause yourself to be sick or you can die prematurely. It is that serious. Amen? And that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 and 30. Two, fear of a certain illness such as cancer that has opened the door to the spirit of infirmity. If you fear these spirits, you open the door for them to come in. They like punks. They like people who are ignorant of the word of God, and they like people who know the word of God but don't believe it enough to exercise it or to use it against the enemy. And I wonder how many people really are afraid of cancer. Because, you know, cancer has become the medical N-word. It's in everything, every kind of cancer. Absolutely. Every kind of cancer. And it's in children. Yep. It's in babies. It's in children. Yep. It's in teenagers. It's in adults. Even the commercial that gets on my nerves, um, the HPV commercial, mom, did you know? Yep. Dad, did you? First of all, why you got to call mom out first? Yeah. Dad, did you know? Right. Okay. Hello. Opening the door for all kinds of infirmities. Yep. Amen. Did I know you was having sex? All right. Right? Okay. Let's deal with it. <laughs> that I fear came upon, upon you. And, and I remember that when I fear something, and I'm like, wait a minute, Woo! the thing that I fear come, come upon me. Come so I'm inviting it in through fear. fear. And on. see, when you get those diagnoses, like we hear so much about people being stricken with cancer, but we don't hear the testimonies of God healing people yes. with cancer. Yes. And that will stir up fear. But see, when you are a child of the Most High King and you know who you are and you know the power of God that is working on you, in you, when you receive those diagnoses, no matter how, I mean, come on, your first instinct may be to be fear, but yes. we, got to, we got to get ourselves together and be like, wait a minute, that's a report. Yes. 
you know, and we have to learn to be like, okay, I thank the doctor for giving me the name. Now I know what to pray against. Right. Right. You saved me the trouble of going, okay, now what is this? Yep. Oh, you gave it to me. So, okay, good. Thank you. Yep. And you have to get that mindset. They plan in your funeral. Right. And you know, these words we know as believers, they're seeds. And when you're fighting a demon like that, you've got to be around people who have a strong mind that can cast his imagination down. Because if you yourself have already been stricken by fear, then we're learning even to a greater level tonight that the very fear can be the door that opens it. We heard Joe say it. The thing that I fear the most has come upon me. So if we believe that, we're going to buy into that, we've got to be around people when we fight this demon who know how to fight. That's why you got to listen carefully to the people that are around you, how they talk. Mm -hmm. What do they say? When you bring a report to them, what do they say? Oh, girl, I'm so sorry for you. Oh, wow. Or, well, we're going to pray and attack that thing. Right. That's right. not of God. That's so right. you better pick your friends wisely. That's right. Because they would add stuff, plant stuff in your head. But you walk to them and tell them you got cancer. By the time you walk away from them, you pretty much got the date that you're going to die. Because they don't talk you into your funeral. Be like, girl, what dress you want to be buried? No, come on. And if you're one of those people who you have that, that neediness on the inside of you, you will possibly unconsciously desire sympathy from people, not knowing that you are Some people, I literally know people who like you to take them up, take them to the doctor. They like when you want to come over there and cook them a meal. And, and to me, okay, you got cancer, you still here, invite me over for a meal. But you know what I'm saying? Because of the mind. It's telling your mind, we are alive, we're going to fight this thing, we're healthy. You can't take the victim, I believe, and that's just me, I believe that most of my life, most things begin and end in our mind. And when we buy into these But you rehearse over and over in your mind what you think, you feel, what you feel, you say, what you say, you speak into existence, and you act. So it's up to you. Just like Proverbs, we said earlier before you got here, Proverbs 18.21, death and life wow. is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. And just how we would com uh, compare that to the garden when, the Lord, when God told them not to eat of the fruit, yes. or they shall die, surely die. So we have to be careful of the fruit that we partake of, that we eat, or the seeds of the fruit that we allow people to plant in us. If you can't be around somebody and be like, you know, I know somebody had cancer and they died. Everybody I know had cancer died. You really don't want to be around that person. No way. I never knew someone who had cancer and lived. If people around you, if, if family members, which we going into it, but I'm going to say it now, we'll touch it again. When family members, if you have siblings or anyone in your family and be like, okay, that one had cancer at age 32, and by the time you reach 32, you'd be like, well, I'm about to get cancer. You, I mean, you you know, sister had it, aunt had it, grandma had it, mama died yeah. from it. You have conditioned your mind just to yeah. think, of, well, you know, on my 32nd birthday, yeah. I'm going to have cancer yeah. that year. Minister Joy. <laughs> um, as you was talking about, the family members yeah. down the line, and when you turn 32, oh my God, I'm going to get it. But now today, it has nothing to do with family members. That's right. Environmental. That, may, yeah. you know, that makes you like, okay, so this could happen anytime. Yeah. And it's like, I, I thank God for Apostle because now we, got, we have to um, tell our minds, no, this, this, no, I cast this spirit out. 
because every little pain, every little ache, and then as you get older now, then they started talking about like the hormones and you know um, menopause. Yep, yep, yep. You have to be yep. careful with all that, and you're like, I don't want to get old, yep. but <laughs> Lord, help us to grow in grace, yes. even as we get older, right? Yes. just wanted to touch on it because Minister Joy ended with as we grow older mm -hmm. and I was looking up the word infirmity I don't know if you've done that already with them or not but it even talks about just old age mm -hmm. just old age so Christ died for what our infirmities mm -hmm. so he died for our old age <laughs> isn't that amazing? amazing think about it because before the fall there was no menopause no. there was no menstrual we didn't need to bleed to clean our bodies out. So he died for our old age. He died for menopause. I believe every woman does not have to go through a physical manifestation of menopause. Yep, and I believe we don't have to. And I actually met a woman who was the mother of the church that I came out of. She didn't go through anything in menopause. Nothing. She didn't have to, she didn't have the hots, the colds. She didn't have the weight gain. She didn't have the... The, the attitude, her and my father still dated, if you get what I'm saying. I was made, he was 62, okay? She, <laughs> she went through it, and, and she wasn't saved, but I believe because we have this information in Christ, we need to stop dwelling on old age. Because when I'm around people, and they be like, you know, when you start getting older, I'm looking at them like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm not just being funny. I'm not trying to, like, like um, speak over my mind like some nutcase. I literally feel 28 years old on the inside of my body. I do not feel it. I don't know about y'all, but y'all need to stop saying just because I'm older or because I'm in my 50s. Why speak that? He died for our old age, and here we go and promoting old age and wonder why we get these problems. When my eyes vision started going, I said to Christ, I don't believe I have to have glasses because I'm getting older. And I didn't have to wear glasses. And I'm telling you the God honest truth, when I went for my eye exam last year, the opt ophthalmologist told me my eyes were better than they were the year before. We got to believe these things in Christ. He died for our old age. Look what else infirmity means. He died for our weakness. Okay? He died for our frailty. He died for our bodily ailment. He died, oh, and then I saw that you already had it on one page here. Um, well, 96 in my book. I don't know what page in y'all. But it said infirmity started in Eden. Y'all see that topic right there? When I looked up in a regular dictionary, not a Christian dictionary, it said infirmity is inherent from human nature, which is the fall. Because we became human nature when the fall came. So we don't have to accept these things. We just have to get back to how our DNA was in Christ. So I'm saying it to challenge y'all. I want you to begin to speak against these ailments of old age or weaknesses, frailty. Um, what is it? Generational stuff. Everybody, my father was a diabetic. Full-fledged diabetic. I don't have diabetes. I don't have high blood pressure, low blood pressure. I don't have the cholesterol that has the problem in it. My DNA was regenerated in Christ Jesus. And I believe all of us can have our DNA regenerated in Christ Jesus. But we've got to buy into, we've got to partner with what the Word of God is teaching us. That's why we're taking the time on Bible study to teach the deep depth of God's Word. Because if we are the Apostles' house, healing has got to start with us. And I don't know if y'all believe it. I believe it. And I happen to be, I happen to be, Standing that when menopause does come to my life, uh -huh. that I'm not going to have it all crazy and be disordered and all miscombobulated and having showers right in the middle of anywhere talking to people. I'm just buying into that. I said to Elder Tangie, at the, we sitting at the dining room table, and Elder Tangie just, water just pouring. I said, what is going on with you? She said, you ain't get there yet? No, I'm having hot flashes. I said, have you prayed about it? She said, pray about hot flashes? I said, I pray about everything with God. Everything. Listen, y'all learn. Pray for every single thing with God. I'm, I'm going to be a little deep, transparent. I'm giving you the mic. This is what made me, this is what made me have such a, a new trust to ask Christ for things that I didn't think I could. 
my first marriage, my son's father, we were having sexual problems. And I was talking to my sister one day. And she said, why do you keep cheating on that man? I said, girl, whatever. She said, no, seriously, why do you keep cheating on that man? He's a good man. He stayed with you, raising the kid. I said, oh, she said, it must be a sex thing because you come from mommy. So it must be a sex thing. Come on, y'all know how we talk in the family. And I said, I ain't going to no details. I just whatever, whatever. She said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray right now. He going to blow your mind. And next time y'all have to say, yeah, all right, all right. He's a worker. All he want to do is he blow his toolbox mind. He ain't blow my mind. <laughs> Honest to God, my sister Bernice in Atlanta prayed for him in our marriage sexually. It went to the skyrockets, y'all. I'm telling you, within a month. Well, I called her up. I said, yo, <laughs> you prayed this on people before? Have you ever gotten any feedback? Because it's either I'm crazy, he taking some kind of pill, or this stuff really worked. And that's when I realized these secrets we keep, Prayer is inviting God into earth's affairs. Why do we not bring God in on these issues that we have and at least try him out? His mind began to change. He wanted to date, because I'm fun. I like to do fun. I do, he was boring to me. And all these things she prayed begin to change him. So I pray about menopause already. I pray about arthritis already. I prayed about migraines. I don't have migraines anymore. Trust God for a miracle. And as a matter of fact, why don't you just test him in the things that you believe that only God can do? If, God, if the doctor can't do it, only God can do it. Just test him. Let's have a little testimony service the rest of this year. And some things that you stepped out in faith on with God that maybe you wouldn't have shared because you were embarrassed, but now your embarrassment has become a testimony that you've got to share it now. To share on the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you because that's an encouragement to other people to know that Christ can answer prayers of our marriage bed, of a bored marriage, of menopause. Y'all not trusting him to be king and Lord over your life because you're dealing with these issues on your own and we shouldn't have to. Amen. Amen. I'm going to get out your way. I know they don't want to hear from me. Amen. So um, now that Apostle went over page 96, <laughs> I'm just going to say this. When you have unconfessed sin, you open the door for these infirmities. And some people are afraid to be healed because they don't want to lose their benefits. They don't want to lose people having pity on them. They don't want to lose that. And that comes from not trusting God. And some people, they want the promises of God, the promises of God healing, but they don't want or they ignore or overlook the conditions that they have to do in order to receive the healing. First one is receiving Christ. But you have to, ob you have to obey God. You have to believe you have to act on God's word. And also, you have to believe that the same spirit that works in Jesus works in you. You can't always depend on the deliverance minister. You can't always depend on apostle or pastor D or the Exodus 18 team to come in like black ops and save you from your infirmity. Because when it strikes you at the midnight hour when you by yourself, you better know that you have the greater one on the inside of you and that you can bind that spirit up and cast it out in the name of Jesus. Amen. When the devil comes in illegally, you have the legal right as the landlord of your body to cast him out. Amen. So you do that self-examination, go down the checklist and see, okay, what gave them the right, if they have any, to come in. And if you go to that checklist and you know that you in right standing, you cast that thing out. You bind it up and cast it out. Amen? Some way God's heal. 97. Anointing with oil and the prayer of faith. Is any sick among you? James 5, 14 and 15. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of Jesus. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him. And when I read that, the scripture says, let him call for the elders. Not get on the phone and call everybody else and complain about your sickness and disease. Right, right. 
You can't go to everybody about your sickness and disease. Right. This, you have to follow the prescription. Amen. 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 So you call for the elders. And when the oil touches the forehead, the individual releases his faith to receive healing in that moment. Agreement. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So you have to reach up with someone that you can touch and agree, but y'all have to be in agreement. You have to be in agreement. You can't have one person praying one thing and another person that don't even believe God going to heal you. You can't be saying, you know, God, I believe that by the stripes I'm healed, and they over there going, boy, I sure hope God answer this prayer. The point of contact here is agreement. Make sure you tell those who are praying with you exactly what you want them to agree with you about. You can't even be ashamed. If you really want the healing, you can't even be ashamed or embarrassed or be too full of pride. If they are praying for one thing and you another, there's no agreement. Of course, that anything mentioned in verse 19 includes healing. So you can touch and agree with someone and pray for your healing. Amen? Laying on of hands. And these signs shall follow them that believe. You have to believe. In my name shall they lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Yes. Do you believe that you right now, you, you, that you can lay hands on somebody and they become healed? Yes. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe it even for yourself? If you was laying in your bed sick, could you believe that you can lay your hands on yourself and receive the healing from God? Yes. Many think that only super spiritual giants of faith are involved in this kind of ministry. But Jesus simply said that any believer who believes can have these kinds of results. In fact, all healthy believers should have these signs following them. That is what the world is crying for today. Believers who truly believe God's word and act on it. You can't believe what you don't know. Amen. So it really boils down to you knowing the word of God and not depending on people who stand up here behind the sacred desk and give you the word. You have to get the word for yourself. You have to believe it for yourself. I can't make you believe the word of God. I can't believe for you. I can believe with you. But you have to do this on your own. Amen. Believers have to believe. Anybody can memorize a scripture, but do you believe it? You may have it here, but do you have it here? Satan know the scriptures, so it's, it will go beyond just believing and knowing. It's, you have to believe this thing. Gifts of healing. For to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit, but all these work of that one and the same self same spirit divide into every man severely as he will. That means God will give you the ability to heal some to lay hands and heal somebody, and you don't have to have a title. Do you believe that? If you was home with a sick child, would you be able to believe that God, because you're not an apostle or a prophet or evangelist or a pastor or a teacher, that you could still lay hands on that child and declare the healing of God over that child? Yes. Amen. There are Christians who mistakenly believe that if they can just be prayed for by someone with the gifts of healing operating in their ministry, they will be healed. But that is not necessarily the case. They may be healed, but then again, they may not. So you don't go around looking, well, I got to find apostle so-and-so. I got to find prophet so-and-so to lay hands on me for me to be healed. You can end up dying looking for somebody to lay hands on you and be healed and, and prematurely meet God, waiting to find that one person that you believe had the gift when God has given you the power and authority. And that's another reason why you don't hesitate when the call to the altar for healing is given. The gifts only operate as the spirit divides them. The gifts of healing operate differently from the other ways 
God uses to heal. So when the, the altar is when the call to the altar is given to be healed, that person who is preaching or calling that altar may only have that anointing on them for that time. So you cannot sit there and hesitate or be so full of pride. Well, I don't want them to know I'm sick. We see you. We know you sick. You need to come up here and get your healing. We hear you hacking and coughing. We, we, we know you sick. We want you to come up. We praying for the spirit of God to touch you, to move you out your seat to get your healing. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh and receiveth, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more should your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask? Have you ever asked God to show you, to touch you, to anoint you, to give you the gift of healing? Have you ever even asked God to heal you and, and, and believe that he will do it? There are a lot of people that, there are some people who say, I have a sister who said that she will not step foot in the church because she believed that the moment her foot stepped the inside, the church going to burn down. She believes she got that much sin in her. Now, where do people get that mindset from? First of all, if you study in the word of God and reading the word of God, can't nobody convince you outside of the word of God. So that's a key right there. If, if you come across people who have that type of thinking, you'd be like, I know you're not reading the word of God. I know you have no type of relationship with God because God is love. And you can't make your sin bigger than the power of God. Exactly. You, he'll tear you down before you tear down. Exactly. You don't turn your sin into a God. Come on. You don't made an idol out of your sin. I pray that any any in here that they get free tonight with this teacher. Come on, Come on, Anybody in here Come who believes that God don't love them or God put sickness or disease or infirmity on them, to, oh, God don't do that. Nope. He don't need to do that. But they might believe that they got it because God don't love them. You just, I just feel that. Could you just pray that in the room? Yeah. I feel that people confess. I know God loves me, but in their heart, they, 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 there's some Especially if they had it for a long time. And they probably feel like they've been praying for a long time, and for some reason, God just won't heal them. And then they try to put it off on, well, I guess it's the thorn in my side. God didn't even give him that thorn. It came from the devil. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you right now. We thank you for your spirit that is in this room. We thank you for your spirit that is in us. We activate the gifts of healing in this room right now. We cast down all pride. We bind up every ungodly strong man that has been operating in the lives of your people, especially those in this room on tonight. We even bind the spirit of doubt that would try to tell them not to believe this word or this teaching that is going going forth in the name of Jesus. Satan, you are a liar and a defeated foe in the name of Jesus. And we bind up all fear, all manner of fear in the name of Jesus. We bind up ignorance in the name of Jesus. We bind up all manner of sickness and disease. We bind a strong man of infirmity in the name of Jesus and we loose the power of God's healing to touch each and every person in this room, even those who do not know that they're sick in the name of Jesus. Father, you said that we can speak things into existence, Lord God. And we speak not of our own authority, but of the authority that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. We can tread on serpents and scorpions, and you have given us power over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall harm us by any means. You said whatever we bind on this earth shall be bound in heaven, and what we loose on this earth shall be loose in heaven. 
and we exercise our right and authority in Christ Jesus to bind and loose right now in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for love, that you are love. We pray, Father, that you will touch each and every person in this room who do not believe that you love them, even though you sent your son Jesus to die for their sins, and not only for their sins, but also to be healed. We bind every lying spirit that would try to whisper in their ear that this prayer is not for you. We bind every tormenting spirit in the name of Jesus. We even forbid you from following them at home to try to catch them when they're by themselves and out of the presence of this congregation. We thank you, Lord God. We loose, Father, your angels, God, with healing in their hands, God, to go to them right now, Lord God, to cover them, build a wall of protection around them, Lord God, that the enemy cannot penetrate. In the name of Jesus, we cast down every ungodly thought. In the name of Jesus. And we release, Father, the thoughts of your word, the power of your word, your healing power, your deliverance power, your power of salvation in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as the servant said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. We're praying, Lord God, that you will help the unbeliever to believe on today. Every report that has been received, everything that has been seen with natural eyes that go against your word, we come against it right now in the name of Jesus. We declare your word, Father, in the name of Jesus that reigns. We thank you, God. And we bring to the forefront of our mind everything that has been tormenting, that has been lying, that has been afflicting in the name of Jesus. And we command it to bow to the name of Jesus. Everything has a name. Cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, it has a name. And it must bow to the name above all names. And that name is Jesus. Bow down now in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we lift you up. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered in the name of Jesus. And it is so, and it is so, and it is so in Jesus' name. Don't you pick back up what God has taken from you on tonight. When the symptoms come, you remind them, I've been delivered from that, remember? I went to church all night. I went to church on tonight, and the Spirit of God showed up, and I've been delivered, remember? I've been healed, remember? I've been saved and set free, remember? Thank you, Jesus. You better remember who you are and who's on the inside of you. What power is greater than the power of God working on the inside of you? That's an insult to God. The God who saved you is also the God who healed you. The God who healed you is also the God who delivered you. Do not retreat. You believe him for your salvation, believe him for your healing. Believe him for your deliverance. This is what the world is crying out for. They see the false doctrine and the false teaching and the false Christ and the false apostles and the false prophets. They heard it all. Glory. 
God loves each and every one of you. I don't care if you just crawled out of a crack house and took an Uber in here. God still loves you. God does not love one better than the other. It's not about a title. It's not about where you live, what you've done. God loves you, and he desires for you to be healed. It is his will for you to be healed. And he did not put that sickness on you or that infirmity or those diseases. That's not his answer for disciplining you. That is not his answer for getting your attention. It is his will for you to be healed. So if you want to know what the will of the Father is for you on tonight, it is for you to be healed. Spirit, body, mind, everything completely. Not just halfway. God don't do half jobs. Amen. Amen. And he has certainly not ran out of healings. You've heard me say it before, the angels are not in heaven on strike. They're not walking around with picket signs. They waiting to hear. Thank you, Jesus. They hearken to the voice of God. So we have to speak the word of God. Amen. Sharita, is it quick? I thought a person can't be healed because they don't want to give up their benefit. Yes. Some people, well, in particular, the person that I prayed and asked the Lord about, I was praying for someone to be healed for a long time, and I'm like, okay, I've been praying for this person to be healed for a long time. God, what's, what's up? Why are they not getting healed? And he said they did not want to lose their benefits, their disability benefits, because if they became healed, they no longer needed the benefits of disability, and they, weren't, they didn't want to give that up. That's like somebody who's on public assistance. They don't want to get a job because they lose their, their assistance from that. That's, that is true. That is true. So there's like some, that. some people will be mad that God healed them, and then they get cut off from disability. So that's, that's what I was saying. That statement wasn't for you. Right. Why, why are you That's not about you. Why are you
Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Answer some prayers up in here. And nobody in here thinks that about you, Sharita. That enemy told you that. And nobody thinks that. He had you thinking that. That we think that about you. And we don't. Amen. Let's go to page 90. We still on page 90. Amen. That enemy, enemy spoke to her. At the bottom of page 98, as believers we receive by faith what our Father has promised us in his word, which certainly includes divine healing. This is God's way of providing healing to the members of the body of Christ. But through the gifts of healing, people can be healed whether they meet the usual conditions yeah. of healing or not, whether they are saved or not, yeah. even whether they want to or not. It is as the Spirit wills. So don't rationalize this and don't test God. Exactly. Amen. Amen. So don't even get mad when somebody, when God heals somebody that you feel like they don't deserve the healing because they don't go to church. It's as the spirit wills. That's like getting mad because God blessed somebody and didn't bless you and they got the blessing that you was praying for. Especially when you want something and you get it and God tell you to give it to somebody else. It's as the spirit wills. Okay, we're going to skip that next part, and we'll go down to the bottom of 99, number five. When you pray, believe that you receive it. So don't pray in hope. It's not like Lotto. When you send a prayer up to God, don't send a prayer up like Lotto. I hope God get this one. You pray, believe, and receive it. Amen? Even if you don't see it, if you don't feel it. 
You pray, you believe it, you receive it. Why? Because it is so. If you're praying the word of God, that is an assurance of answer prayer. It has nothing to do with you. I believe this is the way mature Christians in the faith should receive healing. There is no need for oil or agreement or laying on of hands, all of which are absolutely correct and proper in God's word. But what happens if no one is around to do those things for us when the need arises? You better know. You better know that you know that you know that the Spirit of God is operating in you. We teach our new converts in the Crusades in Latin America that they are responsible for having sufficient faith to receive the promises of God, whether a fellow believer is present or not. I would ask them, what would you do if you were walking alone, picking coffee beans, and a coral snake bit you on the toe? The coral snake bite is deadly, and the action of the venom begins in only 10 seconds. Then I would instruct them, you had better have the faith that works in 10 seconds or you will either be dead or at the very least lose your leg. I was amazed at the faith they developed in their hearts as they listened night after night to the word of God. Now, how did the faith grow in them? They listened to the word of God night after night. I remember a lady in the first church we passed it in Oregon. She was cleaning her cupboards when a black widow spider bit her. Instantly, the scripture in Mark 16, 18 flashed across her spirit. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. She rebuked it in the name of Jesus and suffered no lasting effects whatsoever. This don't mean go out and find insects and spiders and stuff and test God. This means that if it should happen, may God forbid, that you believe God enough that you can pray for yourself and take authority over that spider or that snake or whatever that living creature that we're supposed to have dominion over anyway and use the power of God to be like, okay, not now, not today, not in Jesus' name. I'm healed. I rebuke that. Amen. This is not fantasy. We are talking about basic New Testament teaching that is needed in each believer's life today. The sad fact is that many have slipped so far from the truth of God's word that information of this kind is looked at with skepticism and outright disbelief. Can we not see the deception of the enemy at a time when we need more teaching and preaching about faith than any other time in history, we are spending our time quibbling over which faith teaching is more correct, theirs or ours. Meanwhile, the world is crying out for anything that will stop the forces of evil from chewing them up. God help us to rise above our pettiness and reach the world with the gospel. Now, won't we ever die? Now, this paragraph right here reminded me of, I pray, for two people and they still die. And you think the devil ain't messing my mind? My sister and my best friend both died. But they had to. I could pray all I want for them to continue living, but when their time is up, their time is up. It does not mean that God did not hear my prayer. It does not mean he did not want to honor my prayer. This paragraph right here confirmed it and just set me free. If it is true that God wants to heal everyone who meets the condition in God's word, then we would never die, someone suggests. Now, that's just plain ignorance. Yes, we will die because the word says, it is appointed unto men once to die, Hebrews 9 and 27. Death is the only way short of the rapture that we can get free of this sinful body and into the eternal one that God has prepared for the new creature he created out of us when we accepted Christ as our Savior. Until that day comes, divine healing is a foreshadow of the perfect health we will have throughout eternity. We live our lives out for the very moment God has chosen us to, to take us home to be with him. Not one minute before or one minute later. So, for some, even though you pray, their assignment is over. 
And do not feel guilty about that. Do not fall into disbelief that God won't answer your prayer. When their assignment is over, it's over. When your assignment with that person is over, it is over. If they die, your assignment with them is over. It does not mean that God does not hear your prayer or would not, did not want to answer that prayer. It's his timetable. Amen? Death has no sting. So it is merely a promotion from heaven to earth. Now that bless my soul. What about persecution? Paul's famous thorn in the flesh was nothing more than persecution. And I have read the scripture so many times, and when I read it again in this passage, it just like a light went off. Because a lot of times you heard, I've heard preachers of, well, it was a thorn in my, like Paul, it was a thorn in my side, so this sickness is a thorn in my side. You know, I've heard people give that testimony and preach that. And when you really take time to read the scripture, the scripture said that the thorn in his side was a messenger of Satan to buff him. It didn't come from God. For years, I believed that that came from God to keep him humble, as people have taught. And I bought into it. And I read it to, I was like, wait a minute. That was a messenger of Satan. God did not give him that. But what we should see in that is even though the messenger of Satan was buffeting him, he still did what God called him to do. So God don't need to put a thorn in your side with sickness and disease to move you. The enemy was sent it to try to stop you. This is not to say that Paul or his fellow ministers, I'm going down for the second time. This is not to say that Paul or his fellow ministers was never sick. They had to apply the healing that Christ accomplished to their bodies just like we do today. So just because we saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, have this knowledge, this word, this power, it don't mean that we're not going to be sick or ever will never get sick. We just have to know what to do when that comes. We have to recognize that that sickness is a spirit, the spirit of infirmity and infir the spirit of infirmity we have power and authority over. And when it trespasses, we have the right to bind it up and cast it out in the name of Jesus. You don't have to accept it. Anything that does not come from God, you don't have to accept it. Be like, I'm not taking your gift, Satan. No, no, thank you. If I came in here with a nice saute pan of um poisoned mushrooms and said this is a gift for you would you take it would you eat it check your own life to make sure there isn't any area that you have left open for the devil to establish a toehold he didn't even say a foothold he said a toehold you can't even give Satan a toenail of an inch in your life we don't do pet demons you can't hang around with me. You will not be a pet of mine. If there is, deal with it according to the word of God. Deal with it according to the word of God. Not what you think. Well, if I sit still, they're not going to see these demons. If I don't bother the devil, he's not going to manifest and show anybody I got this demon. No, you deal with it according to the word of God then confidently rest your life on the promises of God. Sometimes the miracle comes immediately, as we would all rather have it happen, but most of the time the healing takes place gradually, step by step, as we walk in the path of faith. So we don't always have the instant miracles. So if you pray and you don't see the manifestation today, don't give up on God. One time I stopped praying about something, and I was like, God, why didn't that happen? He said, simply, you stop praying. I've been waiting so long, I forgot, and I stopped praying about it. He said, well, it didn't happen because you stopped praying. Like, you pick that prayer back up and continue praying. If God did everything instantly, we would really not know God. Because you really learn him and know who he is in your waiting. And you don't respect people that give you everything you want whenever you want it. So you know you're not going to respect God, who you can't see with your natural eyes. He'll be, you'll just treat him like a bellhop from heaven. Medicine is not a sin. Take it in Jesus' name. Until you don't need it anymore. That's what I tell people that take medicine. Well, if I believe in God, then I don't need the medicine. Take the medicine in Jesus' name until you don't need it anymore. 
Okay. Do you want to oh, go through the prayer or no? Go through the prayer. I just felt the Lord um, commissioning us to have communion tonight because healing is in this place. I believe healing of the heart, soul, our physical body. So if you'd like to um, partake in communion with us, you can come on up here and just take from the communion that's being shared today. We want to take it together. I don't know what your needs are, but I believe that that anointing is in the room tonight. Yes. Let's um, leave our cares on the altar. Come on now. That's what I want to hear. Cast your cares upon him. I felt him come through this room. Hallelujah. What did we, what did we teach on Sunday? As if, as like a mighty Russian wind. He wasn't the wind, but he came through like a wind on tonight. I feel his presence. My flesh, come on, is already feeling it. You feel something? Yes. Ah, hallelujah. We had no problem telling, we didn't even tell anybody to praise him or bless him. The whole room just ignited on our own because we're beginning to recognize when he shows up, we need to be here in this atmosphere. There's healing in here. Come on, would you say when we pray to him, we should expect him to come? Absolutely. Amen. And we're going to put that to work on Wednesdays, even if we have to stop in the middle. Praise break, a prayer break, communion, because the enemy would love to steal all the testimonies that we have been. Sharita, stay up here with us. Hallelujah. Stay by the soul, doctor. We're going to heal your soul on tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. By your stripes. Father, you said that as often as we do this, that the only key that had to be present was you. That we are to do this in remembrance of you. Death, hell, and the grave was nothing for you to do for us. We learned tonight about infirmities. So we believe tonight the healing balm is already in this room for every infirmity. Those that we called out, we named out even that of old age, weakness, frailty. Father, the things that have come through the fall of Adam and Eve that we have been inherited by. But Father, just as those have come through human nature, we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. So tonight we're standing in our new creature authority. We're standing not to wrestle, but to stand in authority that we take our legacy and our inheritance back, that by his stripes, Jesus' stripes, we are healed. I don't know what they're standing up here for. It's between them and God. And God, you know what I'm standing up here for, for my body and my being. But tonight, I present my body to you, God, asking that as I take this communion and I lift you up to be Lord and God in my life tonight, I ask that you fill my temple. Holy Ghost, wind blow through this place. Fill our temples, not the brick and mortar, but this temple of flesh and blood that is responsible for the encasing of the Holy Spirit. Have your way in our bodies and our being tonight. Heal us from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. Everything that is out of alignment with the perfect will of God, we call to be in alignment tonight in the name of Jesus. Everything in our DNA, our chromosomes, our hormones, our bloodline, oxygen to the brain, comprehension, thinking, our cycles as women. Father, even the prostate of our men, Father, for you have called us to be healthy. I speak tonight prosperity in our heart, our mind, our finances, our body, and our soul. That as we now eat of this bread, we do this in reminder of you, O oh God. And then we drink of this wine, this juice, Father, which is the new covenant that speaks that we have a right to healing. And we receive our healing now by communion in Jesus' name. By his stripes. Thank you, Lord. Reverend Trish, you can close us out with the binding and loosen prayer. Hallelujah. Just think on it for a moment. Yes. Think on it for a moment. Hallelujah. He wants to do it for us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you for showing us, God, that you want us healed. Thank you for showing up, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, for those of you who are suffering in your bodies, let us pray the prayer of faith. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you boldly as you have instructed me to do in Hebrews 4 and 16. I thank you for your healing power that is as strong today as it has ever been. I receive your healing right now by faith in your word. I believe that you took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses. By your stripes, I am healed. In the name of Jesus, I bind the spirit of infirmity According to Matthew 18, 18, to Matthew 18, 18 which says, which says whatsoever, ye bind on earth, whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I demand that you leave me alone and never return to harass wow. me again. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. I loose the spirit of life into every cell of my body. According to Matthew 18, 18, which promises Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I promise to listen to your word so my faith will be strong and grow. I will continually praise you for my healing for me. This day on, this day on. Amen.
Hello? We want to do an offering before we leave. Come on, saints of God. This is normally what we do. We want to bless the word on today. Come on, we want to bless the word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, and we're blessing the word. Come on and give, and we'll close out, and we trust God for all that he's doing concerning us. Amen. We believe God. Hallelujah. We trust God. We trust him with our healing. And that was manifested on tonight. We seal it with our offering. Come on, we seal it with an offering. We seal it with an offering. Hallelujah. We bless Jesus. We bless Jesus. We bless Jesus. We bless Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we give our offering. We come before you to say thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. We give. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless Jesus. We bless Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Father, we give. We seal it. We seal it now. We seal it with our offering. We thank you. We seal it with an offering. Hallelujah. We thank you. Oh, hey, hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Bless you. Thank you so much for your giving. We bless the Lord for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless the Lord for your offering. Hallelujah. There's still time. Hallelujah. If you would like to be a blessing on tonight. Hallelujah. We bless the Lord for the word. We bless the Lord for the word. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you for this offering. We thank you, Father, and we give you praise for all those who have given before you. In the matchless name of Jesus, we thank you that what has been done tonight, we seal it with an offering. And we bless your name and we honor you. And we give you praise, oh God, for the testimonies that shall come out of this on this night that has been marked by your greatness and by delivering your people. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you that as we leave this place but never your presence, we thank you for tra safe travel. Oh God, mercies, oh God, for those who are traveling on the highways. In Jesus' name, we pray you dispatch your angels before them. That as they are already on the highway, we thank you and we praise you. Amen.